So 34 years ago, I was born in a refugee camp in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Imagine seven months before that my mom, who was pregnant with me, got in a small wooden fishing boat off the coast of Vietnam with my two older sisters, who were five and 10, and a few dozen other refugees. And together, they all went out into the South China Sea in the middle of the night. They were fleeing the country and the only life that they knew. Now, a couple days in this journey, their boat was attacked by Thai pirates who came and raped some of the women, stole their gold, stole their rice, and stole the motor off of their boat. So without a motor, my mom and these refugees were left drifting in the ocean, somewhere between the life they fled and the life they hoped for. And because Vietnam was the closest of the shore, some of them wanted to go back. But others feared if they went back, they'd surely be imprisoned or worse. So they held a vote. And ultimately, they voted that they would rather die at sea than give up on their intended goal. And so after nearly two weeks of drifting in the ocean, my mom and these refugees reached Malaysia. And seven months later, I was born in that refugee camp in Kuala Lumpur for Vietnamese boat people. Now, I tell you this story tonight because it can be easy for me to forget it. Because eight months after I was born, my family and I immigrated to the United States. I grew up on a gravel road over in southeast Portland. So that very dramatic story I just told you of being born in a refugee camp, well, it, it kind of just became this footnote in what has otherwise been a very American life and story that I've lived. And so, that's me, yeah. <laughs> Go Ducks. When I see my mom today, it can be hard for me to see that pregnant refugee drifting in a fishing boat. When I see myself in the mirror, it can be hard for me to see that little refugee baby born in a refugee camp. And when I turn on the news and I see the image of a little Syrian refugee boy drowned on a beach in Turkey, or I see the image of a boat full of refugees from Northern Africa drifting in the Mediterranean Sea, it can be hard for me to see that world as existing in my own. I mean, my world is here or New York. I, I wake up, I check my email, uh, I do some work, I go for a run, I grab a beer. That's the world that I live in. And that other world, that world with refugees and suffering and little children drowning on beaches, that's a world far away and far removed from my own. The two worlds don't exist in the same place, and therefore I don't need to think about it. Of course, we know that's not the case. Not only do these worlds exist in the same place, not only are they one and the same, but for me, that life that life of a refugee is the life that I once lived. And so I think because of this, I've been given a very unique vantage point with regards to how I see life. And as I've gotten older, I've kind of become obsessed. Obsessed with this idea of stories. Stories like the one I just told you, stories that we read every day, stories that we live every day, and the way that these stories can be used to create a thread that connects us. Because really, that's what I've been doing for the past five years of my life, is collecting these stories and creating these threads, but with a very specific focus. Now, I went to school here at Portland State University. I got a degree in economics. I spent many years working in nonprofits. I did AmeriCorps. I joined the Peace Corps. I quit the Peace Corps. I went to a fine arts school in New York City, got another degree in photography at Pratt Institute. Now I've been spent some time working as a journalist with NBC Out over at NBC News. But probably the work I'm most known for is my work with the Gay Men Project. So what is the Gay Men Project? Well, the simplest way to describe it is to say the Gay Men Project is one of the single largest collections of stories and photographs of gay and queer men in the world. And I know that sounds lofty and overly simplistic, but it's, it's the truth. For the past five years, I've been traveling. I've traveled to 88 cities, 37 countries, six continents, and I photographed over 700 gay and queer men. And then afterwards, I asked each individual to write a short story about what it's like to be gay or queer where they live. And then I published these stories along with the photographs online at www.thegaymenproject.com. It's a very, very simple concept, right? It wasn't easy to do, but I did it with the help of many, many people. And what we've all built is one of the single largest collections of stories and photographs of gay and queer men in the world. But when you ask me why, why have I done this obsessively for the past five years? What purpose does this serve? That's when it gets a little bit more complicated. Here we have a picture of me standing in front of a bus with my face on the bus 
and the tagline, Photo Project Challenges Gay Stereotypes. This was a marketing campaign that Portland State has done showcasing the work of different alumni, and I was lucky enough to have been included for my work with the Gay Men Project. Now, when you all look at this picture, it's very clear to see that I'm very openly gay, and I could care less who knows this. But there was a time in my life where being gay was something that I hid from everybody. In fact, it was the thing that I was most ashamed of. And so when I look at this picture, it can be easy for me to forget this, to forget this struggle I once went through, especially when I get caught up in the daily routine of how my life is today with my face on the bus. You know, I could be forgiven and standing on the stage and telling you I'm gay. I could be forgiven for mistaking, mistaking my reality as a gay man living in Portland, Oregon, and the freedoms that I have as the reality of all gay men in the world. But let's take a moment to look at some actual numbers. Let's look at some actual facts. As of today, in 2016, LGBTQ relationships in one form or another are illegal in 74 countries around the world. And in 13 of those countries, being gay or bisexual can be punishable by death. Even in our own country, we all remember very clearly Orlando, in which a gunman went into a gay nightclub and killed 49 people. But did you also know, in the United States today, it is still legal to fire someone for being gay or transgender in 28 states. Did you know that suicide is the third leading cause of death for young people aged 10 to 24? And for those young people who identify as LGBT, lesbian, gay, or bisexual, the rate of suicide attempts is four times greater. Now, I'm not sharing all these statistics with you simply to paint a very somber picture of what it means to be an LGBTQ person in the world today. In fact, there's been a lot of progress. I'm sharing this more so to illustrate how there's still a lot of work to be done and how it can be easy to forget this, especially when we choose to think of these issues as somehow existing outside of the world that we live in, and therefore something that we don't need to think about. So what I've been trying to do with the Gay Men Project in my very, very, very small way, I'm just a photographer, I'm not a policymaker, but I'm trying to use the skills that I have to collect these stories and collect these photographs as a way of making the world seem a little smaller, as a way of making something that may seem foreign and far away feel quite close and intimate, and as a way of building a platform so these individuals that I'm photographing can share their story in a way that may help someone they, all, they may never meet, all through the power of the internet. But what kind of impact can this have? What kind of change can this actually make? Well, let me show you, and to do this, let me tell you some actual stories. This is Jaime Parada. Jaime is the first openly gay man elected to public office in the history of Chile. And you would be amazed, when I was in Santiago, how many people came up to me and cited Jaime's courage in coming out as the reason why they were able to come out in their own lives. And so here we have a very clear example of just how being openly gay and sharing your story can have a profound effect on the lives of other people. This is Peter, right here. Peter runs the first gay men's health clinic run by gay men in Kenya. And it's important to note that in Kenya, sex between two men is still illegal. So we can understand the courage it takes not only to run this clinic, but to simply go to this clinic. And so I was in Kenya and I asked Peter, what are some of the challenges facing young gay men in this country? And Peter cited the high rates of HIV infection, which unfortunately didn't surprise me. But the reason why did, Peter said, that young gay men come into his clinic and they test positive for HIV and they don't understand why. They tell him, I don't understand, I've only had sex with men. I've never had sex with women. I thought you could only get HIV by having sex with women. Now, you and I surely understand that two men can in fact spread HIV to one another. But Peter explained in Kenya, all the official outreach, all the official education, all the official brochures and pamphlets that teach about how HIV is spread speaks of it only in the context of sex between a man and a woman. Well, why is this? Well, remember, sex between two men is still illegal in that country. So imagine being a young gay man and living in a place where the idea of homosexuality is so taboo that no one will even talk about it, let alone consider it in education about how HIV is spread. And we begin to see how sharing our stories, or the lack of it, and the lack of information this results in, can lead to real life implications in the lives that we lead. Now, I received this email once from this young man who lived in the Midwest, and he wrote me this. For one who might identify with that singular truth of self that unites you and your subjects, but whose world is otherwise more isolated, reading of the lives that are very much more free is a sort of comfort, even if admitting so leaves me feeling foolish. 
My thanks won't mean much, but I offer them sincerely. Now, I remember I got this email, and I was sitting on a bus going from Boston to New York City. And I remember I got really emotional, and I was surprised. I was surprised about how connected I felt to someone I had never even met. Now, there was a moment on my trip. I had spent one year traveling one way around the world for this project, and I was in Seoul, Korea. And it was the middle of the night. It was the middle of the, I was standing in the middle of the street, and it was the middle of the winter. And I remember I was just kind of in awe of all these neon lights around me. And my brain almost couldn't process where I was at. Because the day before, I'd been standing on a beach in the Middle East. I had been in the United Arab Emirates. And the day before that, I had been in Kenya. And it had been summer. So to go from summer in Kenya to winter in Korea in the span of three days, and the world just seemed so small. When you travel the world and you photograph hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, you really do get a sense of how small the world truly is and how connected all of our stories are. And you begin to understand the significance of your own story and how it relates to the stories of those around you. And really, it's this emphasis on my story that will allow me to best explain to you why I'm doing the Gay Men Project. Now, I can remember very clearly the first time I had a sexual experience with another man. I was 19, and I had just left the gym. There used to be a Bally's over on 3rd Avenue. And I was waiting at the max for the train, and this guy came up to me, this stranger, he was older. And we must have been making eyes at the gym, because the first thing he said to me, the first words out of his mouth were, do you want to go back to my hotel room? And I did. I really did, but I was terrified. I was 19, and I had never had sex with a man or a woman. I think at that point, I was so deep in the closet, I uh, had never even kissed anybody. So I told him, well, why don't you buy me dinner? So he bought me dinner. <laughs> he bought me dinner. Uh, pork chops, if I remember correctly. And then I went back to his hotel, and I had my first sexual experience. I remember when I was finished, I was, uh, I was driving home. I was living out in southeast Portland, so it was about a 30-minute drive east down Burnside. And I remember I was just sitting in my car, and I was just crying. I was crying the entire drive home. And then I got home, and I drew up a bath of tepid, warm water. And I got in, and I just scrubbed my body down. I just felt so dirty. And then I got out, and I kind of curled into a ball on the floor, and I just sobbed. I cried. I felt so ashamed. And it wasn't that I was just ashamed of what I had done. I was ashamed of who I was. I was a faggot, and I had to hide it from everyone in my life. And I did. I hid it from everyone in my life. Many of you in the room tonight, I hid it from you guys. And I lived with this shame that I had built for myself. Now, sometimes I imagine what it would be like if I could go back in time and talk to that 19-year-old version of myself crying on the bathroom floor and tell him, Kevin, look, I know you feel ashamed now for being gay, but 14 years from now, your face is going to be on the side of a bus. <laughs> Your face is going to be on the side of a bus. And the word gay is going to be written in big, white, bold block letters next to that face. <laughs> and you are not going to feel an ounce of shame. I think that nighttime version of myself would feel some comfort in knowing this. Of course, I can't. I can't go back in time and talk to myself. But I can share my story now and the stories of others for the benefit of the thousands, if not millions, of people out there that still feel that same level of shame for being gay that I once felt. That is the power of sharing our stories and celebrating them and owning them. And you don't have to be gay and have a photo project traveling around the world to understand this or to live it. Because ultimately, it's about finding that thread that connects us, not only to other people, but to ourselves. It's about reminding ourselves of the struggles that we've all been through and the mistakes that we've all made and allowing ourselves to forgive ourselves and draw strength from what we've already accomplished. And any time our stories aren't enough, it's about allowing ourselves to rely on the stories of others for inspiration. Now, I have a little trick that I do, a little secret. I'm going to share it with you all tonight. You can't tell anybody. And I'll end it on this. Whenever I'm facing a challenge, that I feel is too difficult for me to overcome. I imagine I am a 30-year-old woman. <laughs> it's true. I imagine I am pregnant with two young daughters. I imagine I am standing on a beach in Vietnam, about to flee the only life that I've ever known. And I imagine the absolute fear that I must have felt 
as I looked out into the darkness of the South China Sea. And then I imagined the courage that it must have taken to get in that fishing boat in spite of that fear. If my mom can get in a fishing boat in Vietnam and somehow make it to the United States of America, then surely any challenge that I have or that you have is able to be overcome. We just have to have the courage to get in that fishing boat and remind ourselves to share our stories afterwards to help inspire others to find that courage as well. Now look, we all live in a very divided world today. But take it from someone who's traveled around the world and met hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. We're more similar than we are different. And we all have a story to tell. It's just a question of whether or not you're willing to share it. Thank you for letting me share my story tonight.